Thank you. Uh, I declare the first session is over now. <laughs> okay. We have uh, about 15 minutes late, so we'll start the second session. Thank you very much. The, our second speaker is Professor Wolf Schaeffer. Uh, he is a professor of history at uh, Stony Brook University. And uh, he is a pioneer of global history. Also, um, he's now uh, working on uh, a big project uh, to distinguish between functional and dysfunctional management styles in the organization of big science project in the United States and Germany. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, uh, regional capitalisms and global techno science, controllable or uncontrollable forces, or planetary change. Thank you very much. Uh, let me make uh, four qualifications at the beginning. I uh, will talk mainly about regional capitalisms and not about uh, global techno science. I have mentioned that before previous conference and it will be part of the paper for publication but not part of this presentation. Second, uh, I also have to say that uh, my paper will raise more questions than deliver answers. Uh, and then also that some of what I'm saying here is based on earlier work that I did in this conference. And the possibility of attending this conference has given me the chance to think about certain, certain things. So in the first uh, 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 paper I wrote for this conference years ago, that was about global terminology and uh, global methodology. And in the second, I outlined the long-term trajectory of global history with respect to two things, energy transformations and population growth. And I also don't want to go into that, but I just want to say that there is very clear evidence uh, that shows that the time span given to humans to adapt to new uh, energy constellations has grown dramatically shorter. And each energy transformation in human history, the domestication of fire, the domestication of plants and animals, the domestication of fossil fuels, and the domestication of nuclear power, was followed by massive population increases in orders of magnitude and in decreasing order of time, which you will see then when I talk about, when I give my presentation, that this foreshortening of time reduces the possibility of humans to adapt to very different living conditions on this planet. So the time of learning from and about a new situation gets ever shorter. And then uh, thirdly, this is, uh, I have written it out, uh, so please forgive me if I present you my text. Uh, and I want to start uh, to say that in the second half of the 20th century, the human species has become a terrestrial superpower that could theoretically manage itself and Earth's ecosystems collectively, cooperatively, and wisely. However, it is not doing that. The two most formidable sources of human power, capitalism and technoscience, are spinning out of control. They do not provide for the well-being of all people and do not harmonize our planet's nature with the aspirations and capabilities of all societies in the world. To be sure, the wealth of some individuals and some of the 193 countries represented in the UN is increasing dramatically. But so is large-scale economic inequality. Crucial scientific knowledge of global ecology is also growing rapidly. 
but so is ruinous environmental degradation. Thus, the possibility of a catastrophic failure of the global techno-scientific civilization in the next 50 years is a real and present danger. Planetary governance with historical awareness, global foresight, and institutionalized restraint, which is essential for a successful domestication of Earth and humankind, is not forthcoming. Instead, human power and understanding are advancing like wildfire in a self-destructive way. What prevents us from directing the progress of capitalism and technoscience toward a sustainable state of affairs? Must we assume that capitalism is inherently unable to deliver material wealth to all people? Do we have to argue that technoscience is per se incapable of bringing all societies into harmony or balance with nature. Capitalism is certainly very good for some people, and technoscience solves many problems. Yet if this is the best both can do, one might as well conclude that capitalism and technoscience do not work for the majority of people and do not preclude fatal environmental degradation. But how can we really know this? Is the combination of capitalism and technoscience ultimately bad for the terrestrial environment? Will capitalism ever enrich all people in all societies? Alternatively, is a comprehensive socio-economic and socio-natural orientation of capitalism cum technoscience feasible? The capitalism plus technoscience conundrum is about the impact of capitalism and technoscience on humanity's future. The future is, of course, difficult to know in advance. Historians are wont to say that they can only tell the past, not the future. And Ludwig Wittgenstein has famously concluded, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. However, the philosopher wanted to distinguish between rational and religious speech. He had mystical things in mind when he recommended silence as appropriate. The historian, on the other hand, is wary of prediction. He thinks that the future is unknown in a known manner. So let me clarify. When I invoke the future, I do not seek to predict it. Concerned about the sustainability of our species on planet Earth, I aim to analyze the observable present in light of its potential futures. My model for this present-centric approach to future studies is the doomsday clock, which was invented soon after World War II, when atom bombs presented the greatest danger to humanity. Designed by Martin Langstorff, an artist whose physicist husband had worked for the Manhattan Project, the clock appeared for the first time on the cover of the 1947 issue of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. The Bulletin had been founded in 1945. The very scientists who had helped to create the bombs that had devastated Hiroshima and Nagasaki were now deeply troubled by what they had wrought unprecedented weapons of mass destruction. Going beyond their techno-scientific achievement or contribution to winning the Second World War or crime against humanity, they started to refocus and turn to the predicament of their post-war present, then dubbed the Atomic Age, by a New York Times journalist. Between, 1947 and ni between 1945 and 1947, many American atomic scientists became concerned citizens of the world. Pioneering global consciousness, they came under suspicion during the time of McCarthyism. We know better now and can see that the quest for a sustainable future of human civilization emerged thanks to the turnaround of brave Manhattan Project scientists. Alice Kimball Smith has told the history of this momentous professional transformation in her book, A Peril and a Hope. Quoting a comment about the 
In famous 1954 Oppenheimer hearings, she noted that the young dissidents began to act into history as they had once acted into nature. The bulletin, the educational tool of the new scientist citizens, has meanwhile reached volume 71 and carries the motto, 70 years speaking knowledge to power. It was, I quote, conceived amidst the clutter of the local Steinway truck store where High Goldsmith and Eugene Rabinovich drinking coffee with their sociologist friend Edward Schills held passionate discussions in the autumn of 1945 and how the problem of the atomic age might be adequately discussed and recorded. That truck store coffee house was in Chicago, the city where the first controlled nuclear chain reaction had been accomplished in December 1942. Significant is also that Goldsmith and Rabinovich, two former Manhattan Project scientists, hit upon the idea of the bulletin not in cool conversations, but in passionate discussions, and furthermore, not alone or as fellow scientists, but together with a social scientist. My point here is that the present-centric approach for which the bulletin with its doomsday clock stands builds on concrete locations, transdisciplinary collaboration, open debate, and political interventions. It adds ac civic activism to academic analysis. In 1947, the doomsday clock showed seven minutes to midnight, that is, to nuclear disaster. Since then, the clock has been up and running, sometimes moving forward and sometimes moving backward. In 2007, considering catastrophic climate change for the first time, and the nuclear aspirations of North Korea and Iran, it jumped forward to signal five minutes to midnight. In 2010, counting on negotiated environmental progress and strategic arms reduction, it reversed to six minutes to midnight. In 2012, the clock indicated five minutes to global doom again, and it advanced two additional minutes this year. Quote, the clock ticks now at just three minutes to midnight because international leaders are failing to perform their most important duty, ensuring and preserving the health and vitality of human civilization, end of quote. The reasons for the clock's advancement are part of the capitalism plus technoscience conundrum. If the assessment of the bulletin is correct and our political leaders are guilty of not taking care of the whole of human civilization, the uncontrolled forces of capitalism and technoscience are in charge of humanity's future and the human journey will probably end sooner than later. However, if these forces are untamable, like hippos and zebras, which are not domesticable, our leaders are failing because they simply cannot succeed. So what are our options? Are the forces of capitalism and technoscience controllable or uncontrollable? Now I want to look at capitalism as it is and as it should be. Looking at capitalism as it actually is, we must observe that there is no such thing as a globally uniform capitalism. Speaking about capitalism in the singular appears to be a misnomer. Everybody can see that various forms of capitalism exist competing with each other all around the globe. So let me adjust our language to that obvious fact and speak about capitalism in the plural. To complete this adjustment, I would like to call for an additional adaptation to the reality of capitalisms, specifically a geographic denominator that catches the distributed ensemble of capitalisms on the ground. For bagging these varieties of capitalism, I suggest regional capitalisms, a term that crafts the national and transnational formations and expansions of the economic phenomenon in question and casts its net neither too narrow nor too wide. Sociologist Max Weber famously tried to capture the essence of complex social phenomena 
by the construction of ideal types, i.e. the analytical accentuation of certain elements of reality. I quote from Weber, an ideal type is formed by the one-sided accentuation of one or more points of view and by the synthesis of a great many diffuse, discrete, more or less present, and occasionally absent, concrete individual phenomena, which are arranged according to those one-sidedly emphasized viewpoints into a unified analytical construct. In its conceptual purity, this mental construct, he uses the word Gedankenbild, cannot be found empirically anywhere in reality. It is a utopia." End of quote. Mindful of this caveat, I will proceed and briefly distinguish four ideal types of regional capitalism, capitalisms, Nordic, German, American, and Chinese. The Nordic model. The Nordic capitalism comprises the economies of Denmark, the Faroe Islands, Finland, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. Nordic capitalism combines a free market economy with state-supervised collective bargaining and the benefits of a comprehensive welfare state. The nations of this cluster top the World Happiness Report 2013, which measured 156 countries. The well-being of the populations comprising the Nordic models compares favorably favorably with the capitalisms of Spain, Italy, Greece, and Portugal, which are happiness ranked 38, 45, 70, and 85, respectively. The Economist once called the Nordic countries the next supermodel and noted that Nordic capitalism has managed to avoid Southern Europe's economic sclerosis and America's extreme inequality. The German model. German capitalism radiates outward through global exports. Its export hinterland is worldwide, from European Union countries to America and the Asias. The top 10 destinations of German products are France, 8.8%, the US, 8.1%, China, 6.4%, the UK, 6.2%, the Netherlands, 5.8%, Italy, 5.2%, Belgium, Luxembourg, 4.8, Austria, 4.7, Switzerland, 4.5, and Russia, 3.5. However, understanding German capitalism requires a look inside. The Federal Republic of Germany integrates 16 states, called Bundesländer, or simply Länder, with unequal economic strength. The numbers and locations of small and medium enterprises with global reach mirror this uneven landscape. 337 out of 1,116 are located in Baden-Württemberg, the home state of Mercedes-Benz, 257 in Bavaria, and 208 in North Rhine-Westphalia. Unlike well-known global giants like Mercedes or Siemens, their names are unfamiliar, even in Germany. Yet they are the hidden champions of the country, offering unique and specialized products. These SMEs are number one, two, or three in their product line globally, or number one in Europe. Normally family-owned and based in small towns, their leadership style is autocratic, yet encourages constructive participation on the operations level. They have high employee loyalty combined with low sickness rates, keep their know-how to themselves, improve their products continuously, and pay detailed attention to their customers' needs. Additional characteristic features of German capitalism include its strong vocational training tradition, the apprenticeship system we all know, that mixes practical work with classroom education and the right of workers to co-determine the management of the companies they work for. Co-determination, Mitbestimmung, ranges from the board of directors to the shop floor. It aims to balance the profit motive with interests of labor by putting trade union representatives on company boards and work councils, Betriebsräte. 
In the tug of war between economic efficiency and social fairness, Germany nurtures a social capitalism that still prefers to err on the side of social justice. The American model. If German capitalism supports a coordinated, coordinated market economy that forces capital and labor to negotiate, US capitalism empowers market self-coordination. An unrestrained market approach based on liberal economic principles drives the capitalism of the US and the UK into the opposite direction of the German and Nordic models. Anglo-Saxon capitalism vilifies the countervailing power of non-market coordination. It perceives social commitments as socialist and tries to avoid or eliminate them. However, the US ranks number 17 on the world happiness scale, the UK 22 and Germany 26. Popular support for the US model is robust and reaches deep down in American society. Consequently, the American poor seem to be largely unfaced by the country's inequality, which is, by all measures of income, consumption, and wealth, huge and growing. The wealth of a billionaire running for president is generally viewed without envy or political concern, yet governmental regulation of the economy is frowned upon. Mechanisms that would help the poor are seen as harmful rigidities not only by the rich, but also by many of its potential beneficiaries. Handing benefits to unproductive economic agents thus appears to be unreasonable and un-American as well. The American way of capitalism is a capitalism without tears, one could say. Grounded in American culture and attuned to the wants and whims of the markets, US capitalism favors flexibility of capital and labor above all, untrammeled competition between everything and everybody, including company staff, and management autonomy, especially the ability to hire and fire. Ruthless change and radical innovation are at the root of, of US corporations, such as Amazon, Apple, Airbnb, eBay, Facebook, Google, Uber, and Twitter. Category-busting enterprises that demonstrate the vitality of the American model. The Chinese model. If the Nordic, German, and American models of capitalism can be mapped and distinguished by their relative proximity to free market capitalism on one end and welfare capitalism on the other, Chinese capitalism adds a third dimension and different model, state-sponsored capitalism in a single party state. This is the Chinese case from a Western point of view, which notes governmental interference with markets, state ownership of enterprises, and the absence of multi-party democracy. The Chinese perspective, however, is focused on attaining the goal of socialism. Given that, China's current economic model is officially called a socialist market economy, in which market forces play a decisive role. Nevertheless, the salient point of the Western view is the decisive role of the state in the development of the Chinese economy. This is the understanding of most observers, but not all. Nicholas Lardy, for example, has emphasized the enormous productivity, job creation, and rise of the private Chinese sector since 1978, and questioned the dominant Western storyline in markets over Mao. Yet Ladi's data and findings notwithstanding, and irrespective of the true number of state-owned versus privately-owned businesses, it remains convincing that the Chinese government has been creating the space for private companies to do their thing. The Chinese state has not relinquished its economic power to the markets. Markets may challenge this power, but the buck still stops in Beijing at the Chongnan High Gate of the Communist Party of China. The economic toolbox of the CPC includes both passive and active state interventions. Passive intervention is evidenced by the present Beijing consensus, which allows market forces to play an important role in the Republic, People's Republic of China, whereas active intervention was on display in the summer of 2015, when Beijing tried to support its crashing stock market with a slew of countermeasures. 
To be sure, the centrality of the state is not just a Chinese phenomenon, but also a well-known regional feature. The literature abounds with references to state-led macroeconomic planning in East Asia and the East Asian development model, the hard state and the developmental state. It applies the French example of post-war dirigism to economic systems with strong direct influences, directive influences and government investments in the economy. The state-assisted advice of the four Asian tigers, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan and South Korea, as well as of the socialist market economies of China and Vietnam is regularly quoted. Having sketched the economic models of Nordic, German, American and Chinese capitalism, we can now map them on a line from left to right. The extreme left shall indicate a market economy under full-fledged state leadership, and the extreme right a market economy free of any external control and direction. Both extremes are ideal ideal types, meaning we should not expect to find representative examples of either one in reality. Yet the four economic models are abstractions from really existing eco economies. Their positions on the line are not determined by any matrix, only by their proximity to one or the other theoretical extreme, and in the case of the two welfare state models, on their relative distant equidistance to both ends. Figure two shows four regional capitalism. Capitalism as it is, but not capitalism as it should be. This leads to the question, do we ever have to make do with what is? Yes, but only if there are no alternatives. If alternative models of capitalism exist, and we know they do, humanity does not have to settle for the status quo. The current state of affairs is but a starting point. Humanity is free to aspire boldly from that base, and it seems to me that the boldest imaginable goal would be to lift all people in all societies. Capitalism is able to enrich some people. Why not all people? Capitalism has developed some societies. Why not all societies? For a proof of concept, one can analyze how welfare capitalisms have tied companies to the common wheel. The existing portfolio of capitalisms is the economic equi equivalent of biodiversity. They are experiments, test driving capitalistic methods of creating wealth. If humanity approaches its goal with that attitude, it can learn from all capitalisms, including the American and Chinese. The former, for example, has astounding creativity and philanthropy on its side, and the latter the capacity to make executive decisions for a whole country that is surpassing the US as the world number one's economy. China has the largest population in the world with over 1.4 billion people and the world's second largest political party with 88 million members. If humanity resolves to use capitalism of the, for the benefit of all, and China has lifted 500 million people out of poverty in less than four decades, decades, its socialist market economy must be doing something right and the country's closed yet huge single party governance laboratory ought to be studied. Of course, it would be naive to assume that one could simply grab what one wants from the platters of Chinese, American, German, and Nordic capitalisms. They are no buffet arrangement to choose from. However, the very existence of diverse capitalisms betrays malleability. It suggests the possibility of delivering capitalistic gains from the few to the many. Achieving this goal and transforming the world's antagonistical regional capitalisms into agents for the common good is a very big task. It will not happen overnight, neither by a stroke of luck nor through magic or wonder. But it should happen because the Earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. These are the words of Pope Francis. His so-called encyclical on the environment is a full-fledged critical assessment of our present imbalance.
I quote, doomsday predictions can no longer be met with irony or disdain. We may well be leaving to coming, coming generations debris, desolation, and filth. The pace of consumption, waste, and environmental change has so stretched the planet's capacity that our contempt, contemporary lifestyle, unsustainable as it is, can only precipitate catastrophes, such as those which even now periodically occur in different areas of the world. The effects of the present imbalance can only be reduced <coughs> by our decisive action here and now. Last page. Facing the third millennium of the Catholic Church as Pope number 266, Francis addresses the world from a pulpit with institutional longevity and extensive globality. Unlike most other leaders, he is positioned to take the long view and put the present into perspective. Clearly alarmed by our unprecedented situation in history of humanity, Francis notes the difference between rapidification on one hand, that's his word, the continued acceleration of changes, and the slowness and unwillingness to learn from history on the other. His analysis of the roots of our present failures targets the blind faith in growth for growth's sake. And one more quote. The economy accepts every advance in technology with a few to profit without concern for its potentially negative impact on human beings. Finance overwhelms the real economy. The lessons of the global financial crisis have not been assimilated, and we are learning all too slowly the lessons of environmental deterioration. Some circles maintain the current economy, econ economics and technology will solve all environmental problems, and argue that the problems of global hunger and poverty will be resolved simply by market growth. Their behavior shows that for them, maximizing profits is enough. Yet by itself, the market cannot guarantee integral, integral human development and social inclusion. At the same time, we have a sort of super development of a wasteful and consumerist kind, which forms an unacceptable contrast with the ongoing situation of dehumanizing. While we are all too slowly in developing economic institutions and social in initiatives which can give the poor regular access to basic resources, we fail to see the deepest roots of our present failures which have to do with the direction, goals, meaning and social implication of technological and economic growth. Last paragraph. Criticizing capitalism but avoiding the term Francis blasts the, quote, techno-economic paradigm that has deified the markets and threatens to lay waste to all creation. Speaking as a Christian, he acknowledged a reality which has previously been given to us. And as head of state, the Pope is familiar with global calls for action, UN resolutions come to mind, that are rarely followed by actions commensurate with the rhetorical urgency. Still, Francis Lang longs for decisive, that's a quote, decisive political action as a deeply concerned citizen of the world. To save God's creation, he expresses the urgent need to move forward in a bold cultural revolution. That's a quote. Francis seems not to mind the irony of echoing Mao Zedong for a moment. Knowing that radical change cannot come from radical thought alone, only the embodied passion of a spiritual commitment can achieve this. He marshals Christian morality invoking our ecological errors, sins, faults, and failures, commands heartfelt repentance, and requests personal as well as community conversion. Francis wants to shift the prevalent paradigm with a global ecological conversion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We have a designated uh, discussant, Professor, uh, Dr. Myung-se Kang, a senior research fellow at the Sejong Institute. And uh, he has been uh, advisor to the Tripartite Commission, uh, chief editor of Korean Political Science Review, and also chair of Evaluation Committee of Parliamentary Members, Harris and, uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, 
honestly, uh, to me, maybe I'm fully uh, prepared to understand uh, Professor Schaefer. Uh, so my discussion is based on a very brief abstract that was uh, presented to me. And the paper, the piece, very complicated. Sometimes uh, I feel like a reading philosopher, sometimes social movement activist commitment to ecological uh, movement, or sometimes contemporary historian dealing with planetary macro or scale change involving population growth and energy consumption. So my discussion uh, may be uh, very partial in understanding, or de in delivering what he has said uh, now. I like to hope, to see, to read in uh, next time what, what is the uh, reality in, uh, in, in the world. We, we have seen, we have heard a lot of structures in his uh, presentation. Consumption, economics, capitalism, keywords vary. Uh, Sometimes you, you, you will see uh, Tilly look, uh, came back, and the macrostructure, uh, very large chunk of uh, uh, structure. But we need, uh, it seems to me, a mechanism that links structure to reality, such as you need to see what kind of incentive. There are a lot of players, for example, interest group, union members, or employers association interact to create something which you now is, have seen and seen. So this paper, uh, I, I heard this morning, uh, would be published in a uh, couple of months or, or within uh, uh, next year. And I, will, uh, I, I really hope that uh, some agency or incentive working uh, out the, the consequences he really much worry about, catastrophic environment. Who, who causes catastrophe? You need to look at origins and processes, not just consequences. How come this catastrophe occurred in the first? And what kind of historical process we can uh, see uh, that is, I believe, derived from a specific, specify uh, the mechanism to link the incentives and the, the consequences which are focused on. I, I wholly agree with what is, what is, uh, his delivery. I, I believe everyone uh, agree with his uh, uh, commitment. But commitment is uh, different from, uh, let's say, uh, theoretical discussion. So uh, theoretical discussion uh, allows us clearly why do, why do you have this uh, catastrophe and how how is it going to in the future, in, in the, as you say, in the next 50 years? How can we change that kind of question need to be answered in a, a different way? But uh, as you say, your, your paper 
as uh, more questions rather than answers. So I just, uh, my comment is just uh, another question uh, about your, your project. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions we'll get and we'll have an answer to from the uh, presenter. Have any questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, um, Professor, for your insightful talks. My name is Benedict. I'm a student at the Graduate School of International Studies here. Um, yeah, thank you as well for raising a lot of normative questions as I uh, understood your paper. Um, it's, I think um, you kind of suggest um, this, so to say, golden mean between uh, the two extremes uh, form of capitalism. Uh, I, I wonder, and um, we talked about this before in, in framing this title, um, that through having this variety of capitalism, we kind of uh, narrow ourselves down of not thinking beyond even. And, in, and I'm not thinking in ideological terms here, but um, if we, we provide all these kind of frameworks um, within the framework of capitalism, we might lack the language to criticize it, actually, and um, to go even uh, yeah, beyond uh, capitalism. I, I wonder um, what your thoughts are on this. Thank you very much. We'll take just one more question. Is there any question or no comment? Okay. Uh, hello, Rodrigo Silva from Brazil. Uh, I would like to ask you a question about uh, how you classified the American economy in that scale that was before in the PowerPoint. Because uh, I was afraid uh, when I thought about the uh, relative dualism of the American state abroad and in, in the internal arena. Because maybe we accept the premise that United States is a more liberal country than Japan or Korea, but if we visit here in Taiwan, we are going to see a um, concentration of American military that operates sometimes in a very different uh, logic. And does it affect your perception in some, some way? That's the question. Okay, thank you. Let me, I, I will not answer, I cannot answer all of it, what you asked. Uh, but you, the, the second point you made, you said you made a kind of uh, observation that you didn't know what kind of style that was, a philosopher talking or a historian or so. Uh, I think it was, uh, I, I, and that I cannot really answer, I think it has elements of, it's not empirically driven, I would say that, and uh, it is trying to think about the phenomenon. And if you consider thinking about a phenomenon that's problematic, if you call that philosophical, I'm fine with that. Um, then you said uh, you also observed that this was like, uh, I use now my own language, it was too hot. It was like speaking like a social movement uh, person or so. Uh, I agree with that too. And I remind you of my beginning with the doomsday clock uh, that uh, these uh, scientists who had first built the bombs and then were rethinking what they had done, they became activists too. So uh, I think uh, the, uh, we are the people, intellectuals, academics and so on, uh, who have a lot of knowledge about the world. And, uh, and I think, although I fully subscribe to all the rigors of scholarly work, uh, that certain problems, and I think problems that affect the whole world, cannot be coolly contemplated. They should be coolly studied, but uh, in order to change them or to do something, I think it's almost inevitable that you get some kind of uh, uh, passion into this thing. So that's that. Then uh, your observation about the macro-historical, uh, I agree with you too, and I think this is one of the things I miss in our discussions or 
conference like this, because we are all very good at empirical work, um, but we, and we all know that the world is globalizing, which means that there has to be a look at the whole. How do you look at the whole without becoming what you called macro structural or macro historical or whatever? So it's a common deformation of our professionalism that we are not looking at the whole. I mean, as a historian and sociologist of science, I can, could tell you many examples of how it's institutionalized not looking at the whole. I mean, you are, let's say, a scientist who studies the eye of the eagle. Yeah, you do contributions to the vision system of the eagle. But the vision system of the eagle will eventually be incorporated into a cruise missile. Uh, so, uh, but you are not responsible for the cruise missile. But in the end, the cruise missile, we can't, I mean, so we have a problem here, namely that our division of labor basically does not allow us or prevents us from looking at the whole. So I think it is actually a desideratum, a needed thing, that we have to look at the whole. What kind of processes, you also asked, lead to that doomsday scenario? Well, that's, uh, it's related, I would say. It is that we have set in motion, we meaning now humanity in various uh, incarnations, have set so many processes in motion and I said that at the outset, are we in charge, humans, or is uh, capitalism or the capitalisms and technology in charge? If these structures are so powerful, and they are very powerful, if they are creating change, then change can also lead to such negative consequences. And nobody's in charge. And nobody being in charge also means that nobody is responsible. Uh, so uh, the, it's the processes of professionalized, uh, individualized, unconnected, self-driven, uh, and millions of such processes uh, that create a situation that we are basically helpless against it. Now. Um, why the next 50 years? Well, I would say this is just, uh, I mean, Jared Diamond, for instance, has done studies on, on, on why societies fail and so on. I'm not the only one that has the feeling that time is short. And uh, I think you have read my piece on Pangea too, I mean, these transformations. I mean, you go with these various energy transformations from 100,000 years, 10,000 years, 100 years, 10 years, it's forever shorter. So the, the, the likelihood that we are just here very nicely in a situation that seems okay, uh, that in actual fact, uh, the time may be short. But uh, this is, uh, I would say, this is not empirical. And the last thing I would like to, uh, I would think one could mention, so what, what's needs, what could be done? And I think, uh, Institution building is the answer. Um, the, uh, the humans have the biggest creative and powerful institutions humans have built is the nation state. Um, and the nation state is, uh, is very successful and unlike these predictions at the beginning of the globalization discussion in the 90s, uh, the nation state has not disappeared and it's not going to disappear on the other hand uh, after world war ii we built humans built the un much better than the league of nations uh, some decades before but the un is is an institution that goes beyond the nation state and if you want uh, empirical studies then you could study how is i mean they all know they, i know quite a few people in the un that are there, sent from their countries, and uh, they are very hopeful and also very uh, pessimistic uh, because they, they, they see so much and can do so little. And um, 
Another example I think is very interesting, hasn't been mentioned before, uh, is the European Union is a very interesting example of, uh, of institution building. The European Union is comprised of 28 member states that are very, very different in their culture and historical tradition. And uh, they are trying to figure something out that goes beyond the individual nation state. So I think if we want power, if we want agency, and I think we need agency, then the answer is uh, institution building. And, uh, and all calls, that's why I quoted Pope Francis in the end, because his analysis, if he, I mean, there are a few elements that are Christian in his analysis, that he does not speak about the world, he speaks about the creation. Well, he is a Christian for him. That's, that's, that's clear. But his analysis is absolutely to the point of any non-Christian critical observer. And he sees, and again, that comes back to your first thing, the commitment, he sees his answer is conversion. What is conversion? That's something that kind of is done by the whole personality of a human. And he does not think it's conversion only of the individual. He also says it has to be community conversion. Now, community conversion, then you could say, I mean, then look at the uh, European Union discussions and so on. Yeah, maybe that is something that here uh, a group of countries tries to reach a higher goal and without having anyone uh, degraded or left behind. Uh, so it's a, a few things are happening, but at the same time, these processes we talked before are also very fast. And I don't, and I think we have to contemplate the possibility that what Jared Diamond has called ecocide, that uh, societies destroy themselves. I mean, that, that was for small, independent, little entities. We are now a big, interconnected, planetary entity, so ecocide for our thing is human suicide somehow. Uh, so uh, it has to be considered as a possibility that humans do not end like the dinosaurs with an asteroid, that humans end by their own activities. And, and that's the last thing I say, the difference to the dinosaurs mm -hmm is the dinosaurs didn't know what hit them. I have the feeling that we will be hit in full reflexivity. We are the generation and the, uh, we are knowledgeable of all the ills of society and the world and we are at the very same time extremely helpless. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope I can give more time for discussing this, but uh, time is limited, so the second presentation is over, and we'll have a third presentation. Okay, thank you very much.